Welcome home. We are WNST AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are uh, into uh, the week here that uh, these are the weeks I'm glad I don't take phone calls because I don't really, I felt bad for Keith Mills in the post game when I was driving over to Pizza John's on Sunday. Like, what do you say when they've won five games in a row? They're obviously a very good team, um, but they're sort of a pedestrian five and three here as it turns. Luke Jones going to join us right now. We are uh, going to get the Maryland Crab Cake Tour back out on the road. It's all brought to you by our friends at the Maryland Lottery. We have Raven scratch-offs to give away. Our friends at Jiffy Lube Multicare always powering us up, getting us back and forth to where we're going. And, of course, our 26th. Oysters in 26 days for our 26th anniversary, all brought to you by Curio Wellness and Far and Daughter. All that is that on the front of uh, WNST and BaltimorePositive.com. It's the way to find all that. Liberty Pure Solutions, firing us up. Keep my water uh, absolutely clear, man. I mean, you, you, if you have a well, you need people like Liberty Pure Solutions. 1-800-CLEAN-WATER. Uh, they can take care of that as well as all of your plumbing needs. Um I don't know if the plumbing in the Ravens offense is um, what happened to that. And certainly the defense is a question mark. But look, injuries and the the thing I talked to Cleveland Radio about last week that I put up at Baltimore Positive. I was on Kenny Rohde show. I was like, they've been a very, very healthy team until now. Last week, it started to hit the rocks a little bit. Get a couple of injuries. You lose a bad game on the road where you drop balls. All sorts of things were happening. We're going to sit here and pick apart every Marcus Williams decision, every decision to run or throw, and Derrick Henry, and why are we running this play, and what these gadget plays, and can anybody on either side of the ball catch the ball uh, for us? But the injuries are concerning. Um, they're, they always need to be concerning, but uh, when you start taking elements off the field like Marlon Humphrey, um, things change here and change sort of rapidly for what Jameis Winston can get away with on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, uh, and I'll go back to what I said in our previous segment that they're not concerning in the big picture sense in terms of like these specific injuries they're dealing with. You know, I expect Marlon Humphrey to be back this week. Uh, I would assume Nate Wiggins will be back this week. You know, the way it sounded was he was under the weather. I mean, because he had come back and it seemed like the shoulder wasn't uh, an issue. And then he was added to the injury or illness was added to his injury designation and he ends up not traveling. So that felt like more of an illness thing than the shoulder. Uh, but I think what it is, and Michael Pierce is the one we'll see, you know, a, a calf is tricky for anyone, let alone a guy who's 350 pounds, right? So that's the one that I have a little more concern about in terms of going forward and, and what that means. You know, Travis Jones dealing with an ankle going back to last week. I, I was kind of surprised he even played, but it, it spoke to, you know, kind of where they are. But I think for me, the bigger sort of concern, it's a reminder, however, that they have been extremely healthy up until this point. When you consider who was missing from their first seven games, and they, they had some guys miss a game here or there, right? But by and large, when Arthur Millette is really your only long-term absence of consequence, that's you'll take that. And nothing against Millette, right? He's a, he's a nice, solid veteran nickel player, but he's not the integral critical part of your defense. You know, he's not one of your tent pole players on your defense. So I think it's a reminder that it is a long season. And if you do have some more substantial injuries along the way, which inevitably they're going to have a couple, every team does. It is a reminder that, and that's part of why I was so disappointed in the, in the defense. Not that I expected a shutout. I didn't expect them to, blank the, the Browns or to hold them to seven points. But it's a reminder that when you are a little less than hundred percent, that happens quite often and you can't just have everything go to, you know, where, right. And that's what happened on Sunday. I mean, they let Cleveland score 29 points. They let Jameis Winston throw three touchdowns in the second half. He went over 300 passing yards. So yeah, the injuries were part of that, but at the same time, you're going to have some injuries over the course of the season. So it does speak to one of the points that we talked about, Nestor. And, you know, as we were talking about the attrition that they endured in the off season and, you know, the coaching right off the bat, but more specifically when we got into March and Jadavion Clowney's out the door and Gino Stone's out the door and Ronald Darby's out the door and Patrick Queen is out the door, 
right? We didn't talk about it in terms of, oh, well, their starting defense is terrible now. We didn't think that. But what the point we did make was they're not nearly as deep at some of these positions as they were a year ago. And Sunday was a great example of, well, boy, it really caught up with them big time because their defense, even against a backup quarterback and against a group that hadn't had any success offensively to this point, I mean, they 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 got gashed and they gave up the yardage they did. They gave up the second half points that they did. I, I think for me, the, the disappointment was in, once again, getting worse as the game go, goes on. You know, I could almost deal with this, what they've done, if they were a team that started out shaky in games and then played really well after that. That's why, to me, the Tampa game was so encouraging until the fourth quarter. I mean, they blanked the Buccaneers in the second and third quarter, and you thought, hey, they figured this out. And then even though it was garbage time, they still gave up too much. So, but 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 speak, speaking specifically with the injuries, again, I don't think these this set of injuries they're currently dealing with are a bunch of long-term things, but it is a reminder that they were really, really healthy through the first seven games. And their defense still wasn't particularly good. So that's where you look at this thing and say, boy, you better stay healthy. And more specifically, you better find some reinforcements. And specifically, I know people will talk about safety. And we've talked about Marcus Williams and, and where they go from here with that situation. But they need more edge help. You know, they, they need more from an edge rushing standpoint. And I know they brought in Ngakwe. I think Ngakwe is fine as your number four, number five guy in the rotation at this point. But right now he's their number three in the rotation. And I just think they're they're needing to rely too much on Van Noy and too much on Owe. Heaven forbid if something happens to one of those guys, then you're really talking about your pass rush being in a bad place. So uh, I think Sunday is just a reminder of what we knew all along, but hadn't really come into play as much to this point in the season. It's they're not as deep as they were a year ago. And you saw what happened when the injuries did mount a little bit on Sunday. Mounted a lot in the case of the defensive line with just how short they were. I think it mounted a lot in the secondary uh, and missing those guys back there when they did. And the Marcus Williams thing is curious. And John's going to get questions about that. Trading deadline. And we're going to talk special teams before this is all over because we're not going to let Tucker off the hook because we got to figure that out. But and even decisions on special teams for the pass rush. And when you're like, well, they could trade for this or trade for that. They've traded. They've had no problem going out. Roquan Smith in a year where they feel like they can win the Super Bowl. It, it like draft picks won't matter as you know, F those picks, as they said one time in LA, um, they're never going to do that. They're I never going to say that. Yeah, I understand. I got that. you. Go ahead. Sorry. I got that. I got that. But I think if there ever is a time to say, if something's available, Zadarius Smith is available, and he's going to markedly make this team better in an area where I just don't think they have enough pass rush. You know, I mean, I've, I'm halfway through the year. But I don't think the personnel they have, or if you're waiting for Kyle Van Noy to find the fountain of 28, because he's not, and where you are with Roquan Smith and pass coverage, I think what you see is what you get right now. Um I think they're asking Kyle Hamilton to do a lot, right? Like a whole lot, including catching the ball sometimes. Um, but the pass rush. And as I look at Eric and I look at the franchise and I look at the way they sort of want to wheel and deal and where they are and cap numbers and like all of those other things, I have a feeling this will they, – they'll be on the phone this week because I think Eric's looking at this and saying, this might not be good enough. But we have, even healthy, if we, we get there in January to navigate – I don't know, a home game and a couple of road games, you know, a, a game in Buffalo a game, and then winning that and then having to go to to Kansas City if that's what you think you're going to do, if that's where your pathway is. And, yeah, we beat the Bills up a couple of weeks ago and all that. Wake me in January when you got to win three games in a row and you have to have a pass rush and you have to run the ball and Lamar has to be protected and guys have to catch the ball and Tucker has to kick the ball and John has to not have his little red flag looking up and throwing goofy time. Just situationally – they're going to need to be, I don't want to say flawless, but I'll use impeccable. There's another synonym for you. Um, they need to be. In big yeah. games. I'm talking about in January, and they're going to need a pass rush that's 
no, no offense to OA or even what Matt Abike was last year. I'm not, I'm not seeing it in here and now, and maybe it's Zach or maybe it's the back end being depleted, but Jameis Winston beat your ass. You get whatever you get from us this week and from the fans. I mean, like it, that that's below the bar, as you said a little while ago. Yeah. I mean, I, it just needs to be deeper. And again, it's, it's not about Kyle Van Noy. It's about not putting too much on Kyle Van Noy because he's 33 years old. Kyle Van Noy's had a really good year. You know, that, that when we talk about these things, it's not, it's not even the indictment on the starter. It's needing to be deeper, right? You can't just have one guy doing it. You can't just have two guys doing it. Uh, I mean, okay, if it's Max Crosby, then fine. Maybe he can do it because he plays every snap, right? Uh, Miles Garrett plays most snaps, right? Well, Kyle Hamilton so, played a couple of snaps in a row that had you that. calling him a superstar and putting him in all the fame in the second quarter, right? Like Kyle Hamilton's being asked to be that guy. He's 24 years old. I guess he can be, right? Well, I mean, they need to clone him. <laughs> I mean, that, if you could clone Kyle Hamilton, you'd be fine, right? I, I mean, he's that good. And again, that. Him dropping the interception was agonizing. It was excruciating because he had played a really good game. But in that one instance, they had the chance to win the game right there and he dropped the ball. Uh, but but I guess you know, to what you just said, and this speaks to the injury question, this speaks to depth and, and they need to be sharper across the board. You know, there's just even in their best performances this year, we talked about this with the Tampa game. You know, I mean, that that was a really good performance overall, even with the defense doing what it did in the fourth quarter and, you know, had Ed Reed taking a shot at him, which wasn't unfair, uh, even if it felt a little harsh in that context. Uh, but they're still prone to dumb stuff. I, and I'm not calling any individual player dumb, but as a football team, they're still prone to some stuff where you just scratch your head. You know, that I mean, they had a, a kickoff where they had two different guys commit a penalty. Uh, on Sunday, you know, they, whether it's a, a weird play call from Munkin, right. Who who's done such a great job with this offense, but they'll still line up and do something where you're like, where the heck did that come from? Like, what the heck was that? Or someone commits a penalty and you're like, what were you, what was that guy doing there? There's just, there's still a little too much of that than you'd like from a team that fancies itself as a serious Super Bowl contender. Right. We've talked about this so much and fair or unfair. It's the standard because that's what, who everyone else is chasing Kansas city, right? One thing that they have perfected and maybe, maybe I, I didn't see a second of their game against the Raiders on Sunday. So maybe, maybe that was an exception because I know it ended up being a, you know, a relative, you know, it was a close game, but they have seemed to, perf- to have perfected working smarter, not working harder in the sense that so rarely do they truly beat themselves. Now they play with their food going back to last couple of years. They've got, they got to the point, even, even towards the end of, of the, the Tyreek Hill era uh, of the chiefs with that explosive offense that they had a few years ago, they got to the point where you almost felt like they'd get a little bored and, and they just let teams hang around a little bit. And, Again, they don't blow teams out necessarily, but when it comes to crunch time, you don't see them do dumb stuff. I mean, the, the AFC championship game was a perfect example of that. I mean, we, we everyone would was dwelling on the on the run game, but remember the penalties from the defense goal before halftime? How huge was that field goal in that game? Uh, you know, obviously the Zay Flowers taught and then fumble at the goal line, right? You just don't see Kansas City do those types of things, even though this Ravens offense is much more talented across the board than the Kansas City offense at this point in time. And, and Lamar Jackson, in terms of how he's played in the regular season, has played better than Patrick Mahomes in the regular season. But Kansas City recognizes high leverage better than anyone. And in crunch time, they don't beat themselves. And we see the Ravens still beat themselves too often. And that's what's so frustrating because you said it, and I don't disagree. Uh, You know, you can do this with a lot of teams and a lot of games in the NFL because there aren't many blowouts. Most of the games are close. Uh, But, you know, you you look at this team and they're five and three and 
there's a path that they could be eight and zero right now. And it's not like this pie in the sky, unbelievably unrealistic sequence to, to be eight. No, it's you're talking a play, you know, one play in, in any of those three games. Now, on the flip side, by the way, that was the, the same Cincinnati story from last year, by the lost, way, too. Right? right. So, again, I just the second season in a row where yeah. you could say and the, the year losses before, they had right? were all these goofy, crazy things. You're like they were losing for a minute yeah. and a half and had three losses somehow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the less and the less. In here isn't that they need to go 17 and 0 or they should go 17 and 0. What we're talking about here, though, is as it pertains to what you need to be in January, which is you need to be tight around the margins. You got to be really good around the margins. You got to run a clean ship. You can't be committing penalties. You can't have issues with the clock. You can't have substitution problems the way this defense constantly has them because you might get away with it in one playoff game. But if you need to win three or most likely it's looking four in a row, if you want to, you know, at least three in a row to get to a Super Bowl, can you do that three times in a row and get away with it? No, because and this is part of my frustration. I get it. They were banged up on Sunday, but we talked about it. Their past defense hasn't been very good, even when it's been healthy. And all right. I get it. They've played a tough schedule, but uh, in terms of opposing offenses, Sunday aside, but who do you think you're going to be playing in January? You know, you're not going to be playing lousy teams in January. So you're going to go up against good quarterbacks. You're going to go up against good offenses. So you're going to go up against good teams. You're going to go up against teams that can defend and and do what Kansas City was able to do against the Ravens uh, in week one. So you've got to be cleaner. It's got to be a tighter operation. You can't have these meltdown periods that they're all too prone to, to doing. And, Again, that's not that they clean it up to the point where they go 17 and 0. That's not the goal. But if you're trying to project this out, and this team from a talent level standpoint, absolutely is more than talented enough to win a Super Bowl and to get to a Super Bowl and make a deep January run. But you got to play smarter. You know, you can't have these breakdowns in ways where you just look at it and say that was more of a self-inflicted thing than anything that the opposition did. And that's what's just that's what's still frustrating about this team because my goodness, they go through these stretches of time where they look almost invincible, but then something happens and you're just like, what the heck was that? Uh, I mean, and then, and that happens even in some of these performances where they win, that's still happening too much for my, for my taste. And I think John Harbaugh to a man, he might, might not spell it out in a press conference, but I'm guessing behind closed doors, that's still frustrating to this coaching staff. But what I would say to that is the coaching staffs had p- played a part in that, whether we're talking about a weird challenge or a, a play call that just makes you scratch your head or not managing the clock properly or not getting a substitute in. There's just, or how about Charlie Kohler on the other center to, or, or, right? I mean, or, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just weird, like weird stuff. And again, I like creativity. I am never going to say that, you have to line up and play it straight every single play. I love creativity, but creativity that takes Lamar Jackson out of the picture as a, a run threat on fourth and one or a run threat on third and one. And he doesn't have, even have to get the ball, mind you. I'm not saying Lamar must carry it in that situation, but he must be a threat to carry it in that situation. And that's going to make the play better whether it's Derrick Henry or whoever's getting the ball. I mean, heck, handed to Patrick Ricard even on a fullback dive, but at least there. So, you know, it's just, there's still just too much weird stuff that just makes me scratch my head with this team because they're so talented. They're so good. This offense is, has a chance to be historically great. And that's saying something on the heels of, what they've done over the previous five years, right? When Lamar's been healthy, their offense has been great or at least really good. It's been rare. You know, I, I guess maybe the, the very end of the Greg Roman era uh, aside, their offensive output has been excellent since Lamar took over as quarterback. But in terms of some of these things we're talking about that can cost you in a close football game, they, they just, they've got to be smarter and cleaner. You know, they've got to, they've got to be better in that way. And that's where, it's just frustrating because you just look at some of these things that happen. And even in the games where they've won, there's still 
a handful of plays where you just say, like, what was that? It's like they lose their mind temporarily uh, in some of these spots, you know, whether it's coaching or mistakes on the field. I mean, it's everyone. It's not just one thing. It's across the board. Uh, but those are the kind of things that doom you when you're trying to win three or four straight games in January and early February. And those are the kind of things that when we get to that point in the year, Kansas City doesn't do. And you can say, well, that's Kansas City. But hey, if you ever want to get over the mountain, you want to get over the hump, get to the top of the mountain, you're going to have to beat those guys most likely. Unless unless Buffalo or Houston does it or sign with given their schedule or their record at this point. Luke Jones is here. He Even is Baltimore schedule, Luke. But uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You've got. To... Sorry, sorry. I was just, I was just finishing up. You've got to have a clean operation three or four weeks in a row. And this team on a weekly basis, even when they're playing really, really well, there's still too much of that that's going on to expect that that's not going to bite you against other good teams when you're playing in January. Go ahead. We got a little delay in the line. Luke's here. Uh, all of brought to you by our friends at Jiffy Lube. He's Baltimore Luke. Um, we're into it. Hardcore. You can find everything out at Baltimore Positive. We're going to be talking about all of this. It's an election week around here. Uh, had a great show at Mama's on the Half Shell on Friday with Finn McCusker, as well as my one of my dearest friends, Howard Scher. Uh, we uh, did a little skipjacks throwback, a little hockey. Talked some, some Ravens and some Orioles as well. He's a big Oriole guy. He's a Birdland member. Gave me a lot of information that I don't think I've ever put on the air in regard to season ticket holders. So you can check all that out. All of that brought to you by friends at the Maryland Lottery, as well as Jiffy Lube Multicare. And of course, Curio Wellness and Foreign Daughter, as well as Liberty Pure Solutions, putting us out in 26 oysters, 26 days, 26 ways. We've been at this for 26 years here at WNSD. It's still on the morning after you lose to the Browns in Cleveland and you drop balls and you miss kicks and you miss a line and you get beat by Jameis Winston. I mean, almost like a punchline. Um, I, for, for me, this next 10 or 11 days now, um, I would say it's treacherous. If they're on a six game winning streak and they're six and two, they drop a game. Now they've dropped the game. Now, now they've, they've had the, the bad beat, the loss they shouldn't have, the one that when the schedule comes out, you're like, they're one and six. I mean, I know Lamar's a little different, but when he stands up on the podium and says, I know everybody thought they were a sorry team. And I'm like, sometimes there's a little bluntness going on there uh, about how sorry they were or not. Um, Denver's coming in. I, I thought Denver was a sorry team all off season. I, I, I felt sorry for Sean Payton taking that gig. Um, and the whole... Russell Wilson thing feels like yesterday's news. He's Pittsburgh issue now, and uh, his wife's making sexy videos for his birthday. It was all nice. But Denver's better than we think. And then Cincinnati, which looks like a pushover like Cleveland did, like they look like they're not very good. It's a little treachy. Get two games in four days coming up. You got all these injuries. Where are we with Wiggins? You're pretty confident that Marlon's going to play or whatever. We know nothing about Pierce. Uh, Brent Urban, obviously. So there's going to be some rotational issues. There's going to be some depth issues. And there's going to be what Anthony Richardson tapped out of the game, saying, I'm tired. What's quarterback running around? Just being honest. Wide receivers do it all the time uh, when they run sprints. Um, they're going to have to, like, go play two really hard football games, division game. Um, this is not an easy little stretch for them at all. And all of a sudden now, five and three doesn't feel like a whole lot of daylight to me at all. It feels very, I said pedestrian. I mean, the, let's go Bill Parcells. You are what your record is. Five and three. Five and three is like, or, that's 10 and six. That's ordinary. Um, that's scuffling if you take more injuries on and Lamar can't play for a week or two or anything. They have not bought themselves any rope at all here. Certainly not in chasing Kansas City, which, you know, get the barbecue ready if you can get there in late January. Now it's how do you even figure out a way to get there? How do you figure out how to beat Denver this week and then get ready for Cincinnati? And then you get a little mini buy. But seven and three sounds really good. Six and four sounds, eh. and I, you know, I don't know where it is, but Dude, I just watched them lose to Cleveland and Jameis Winston. There's no automatics here. That it. I mean, as much as you lean on your priors and look, I mean, a week ago we were talking about this being the best team in the NFL, right? And I still think they have the best offense in the NFL. I do. I mean, I really do. Um, but 
when you have a defense that even hasn't looked great when you're fully healthy, and then you mix some injuries into that equation. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll say this with Denver. They're, you know, you you look at them. I, I agree. They, they've absolutely been better than anyone would have expected. In fact, what's kind of wild, and I'm just looking at this now. So this is real time, me looking at the standings. They are five and three. Kansas City is seven and oh. So they have played one more game. Okay, so this loses a little more steam, but you look at them. They've scored the same number of points, and they're almost the same number of points allowed. One more game, so I get it. It loses a little bit of steam, so that's why I don't look at something like this in real time. But point is, they played pretty good defense. You know, they they're not they're not a a pushover. To your point, I think the Ravens are very clearly going to be favored, and they're going to be favored by more than a couple points, and should be. But this is not a team that you just roll out the ball and expect that you're going to sleepwalk to a victory, especially knowing that Cincinnati is coming to town four days later and there's going to be a lot of attention paid on that, knowing it's a division game. And on the flip side, this is a Bengals team now that is three and five and they're in must-win mode. They must, if they're going to make the playoffs, they have to beat the Ravens on that Thursday night game. So, And the Ravens know that too. So you need to fight the urge to look past Denver and they shouldn't be looking past anyone to your point. When you lose the Jameis Winston and the Browns, you shouldn't be looking past anyone. Cause you know, it can happen to anyone at that point, no matter how great you look in some of these other games, but it, it is a team that is better than I would have thought. If you had asked me back in early September, what Denver's record would be coming into Baltimore, the first, you know, the first uh, Sunday in November, I certainly wouldn't have said five and three, that's for sure. So you got to play good football. And again, this goes back to, some of these things are not, it's not that complicated. That's what's so maddening about this. Catch the ball. Don't do dumb things that draw you pe- that draw penalties. Don't lose your mind as a play caller. Get your operation cleaned up that you sub players in and out. Like that, that's, co- high school coaches have to do that, right? I mean, like, think about how long these coaches have done that. And these players have done that. This isn't like, you know, it's, at some point in time, you got to remember, and you know, you say on the flip side, you hear the, the expression, they're playing chess, not checkers. Sometimes it is checkers and it's not chess. And you just need to keep it simple and, and so, with some of these things that they're having issues with. Well, Wink so, Martindale didn't have these problems that, quite frankly, Zach Orr's having, right? And when you've done it for 25, Jim Schwartz doesn't have these problems because he's been doing it for 25 years. It's, just, it's a different it's a different deal. It really is. I mean, especially well, the, the Christmas of and, the operation that you want – um, making those decisions in real time when you haven't done it and the bullets are flying. I mean, it, you were alarmed three weeks ago when they brought Dean Pease in, right? You were a little alarmed. And you saw him sitting up in the booth next to Munkin as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just, and again, it, it's not an anti-Dean Pease thing or that, oh, well, you know, he would have gotten fired if he didn't retire back at the end of 17. Dean Pease has done this happened. in his sleep for 50 years. But, but that said... Doing that five games in, if, if they had done that in early August, you say, hey, that's that's a pretty shrewd move to, to bring them in. You do it five games into the season. That's a that's a tell that all was not well with your operation in some way. And again, that doesn't mean Zach Orr is going to get fired or should get fired or he won't become a good defensive coordinator. But right now, there are concerns right now. It's not good enough. And he's in charge. And I say that as someone who's a has a great personal fondness for Zach Orr and his story and his ascent, you know, transitioning from a player whose career was taken away from him because of a a neck issue to becoming a defensive coordinator and a guy that may have very well wound up as Seattle's defensive coordinator if the Ravens didn't promote him. I mean, this wasn't just some, you know, it's not a charity case or or, or just because he was the only guy left. They they really liked him and they didn't want to lose him and other teams were sniffing. Well, they liked him more than they liked Anthony Weaver, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but that said, put all that aside. That's, that's January, February, and March stuff. It needs to be better. And he's in charge. And whether you're bringing in Dean Pease or whoever you want to bring in or whoever you want to add at the trade deadline, they need to get better. And the buck stops with really the buck stops with John Harbaugh and Eric DaCosta, but specifically for the defense, he's in charge. So you've got to figure this out. And whether that's 
whether that is benching Marcus Williams or putting him back on the field or benching someone else or playing other guys more and other guys less. I mean, we talked about David Ajabo being a healthy scratch. I mean, look, the benching of Marcus Williams James is curious, dude. Like, from, if this weird, were sure. normal time and they had normal answers out there and there were moles in the organization, it it feels like there's a little turmoil. I don't want to use the word turmoil, but you're five and three and your defense is scuffling in a defensive building in a building where defense has always been there and they've always done things from within and Zach Orr is a within guy. Um, you know, benching your $18 million safety and then losing um, when you already had two corners out. I mean, I'm going to write that it's, as, as there's turmoil. In the mean, de- turmoil would be the word. I want to make sure I got the right word. I'll look the definition up, but I'm going to go with turmoil for now. Yeah. It's very telling. When you make a move like that, and again, I'm not even saying it's the right move or the wrong move, but just the fact that you make the move itself on the heels of knowing that two of your top three corners were going to be out. And let's face it, Nestor, it's not as though their other safeties haven't been on the field. They've seen plenty of Eddie Jackson. Even at this point, they've seen plenty of Ardarius Washington. We know Kyle Hamilton's a dynamic, fantastic player that they like to move all over the place. So it's not as though this was a case of, oh, let's play Bo Braid or let's play Sanusi Kane or let's play some random guy that we just got off the practice squad that we think is a diamond in the rough. This was, they just said, we don't want Marcus Williams out there. And that's where I still wonder if there's more to this. Because as I said, Zach Orr less than two weeks ago had said that, Marcus Williams was practicing at a really high level and they were feeling really good about him turning the corner and getting back to the player he was the, the last two years. And he, it's not like he individually did all these bad things in the Tampa Bay game, right? To, to warrant, oh my gosh, the guy needs to be benched. You know, it's not like an offensive lineman who you can clearly see gave up four sacks and then you're benching that guy. So between that and the fact that he was fully healthy, the fact that he was active and did not play a single snap, even on special teams, I mean, that was very telling to me, very illuminating and very much. That feels like punishment. If there's what that more feels to like. this behind the scenes. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And again, I don't want to draw that conclusion, but it's a question, right? It's and, and I don't know for certain. Um, You know, you hear things over the course of the week and. I know on Wednesday he didn't take a bunch. Uh, he didn't take his normal reps, but I can also say with full disclosure, Nestor, veteran players not taking their normal assortment of reps on Wednesday. Like for example, I've seen times when we're heading into the practice field, not not this week or, or last week, but I've seen times where Chris Board's lining up in Roquan Smith's position, not because Chris Board's going to play, obviously, it's because they're trying to get Roquan off his feet a little bit more and give him a little more of a blow. So when I had kind of gotten wind of that last week, that's what I assumed it was. Cause again, it's not like Marcus Williams played so much worse against the Buccaneers than he had in previous games to say, Oh, now's the time to bench him. Uh, you know, I thought, it, I thought, I don't think it was his best game of the year, but I would venture to say it was one of his better games of the year, but which might be kind of damning him with praise. Cause he just hasn't been very good, but it's just weird. It was weird, especially considering they still had issues on the back end. And you could have you could have said, uh, you know, you could have benched Eddie Jackson at, at some point, brought Marcus Williams back in the game. I mean, Eddie Jackson dropped two picks in that game. Uh, so maybe I guess maybe the, the bright side would say he got his hand on two footballs. Uh, but it's just safety has been a problem all year. And we thought it was going to be one of the biggest strengths of this team. Kyle Hamilton's outstanding. So it's not him dropped interception aside. But the rest of these safeties, it's a major problem. And when you couple that with Roquan Smith and their inside linebacker pass coverage issues, I mean, that over middle portion of the field has just been a sieve. Uh, I mean, it's it's a problem. And teams know it. And they're going to throw it and throw it and throw some more. And even when you're in a position where you think, oh, they might run, they're going to throw because they know that you stop the run, but you can't stop the pass as the day goes on. So 
Oh, and then they get gassed and they can't pass rush. So, uh, and then they, it, oh, it, yeah. it gets worse sure. as the game goes on. By the way, look turmoil up, Luke, just so you know. It all adds a, up. A state of great disturbance, confusion, or uncertainty. Well, the disturbance was the loss. The confusion's evident on the field. And the uncertainty is we're sitting here guessing all sorts of things. So turmoil. There you go. See, I am a professional writer after all. Luke Jones is here. He is Baltimore Luke. Uh, he will be out in Owings Mills for regular week then super duper short week next week for Cincinnati so we really are getting ready for two games here we're watching the World Series and all that um last thing for you and you can pile on anywhere you want with the Zach or the defense or any of that but the trading deadline and the trading thing and the state of the Ravens salary cap trading situation look when you've traded for Roquan Smith and given him a hundred million dollars in, in Halloween week I, I don't rule anything out in regard to the franchise and I guess I use examples would be like a Minka Fitzpatrick going from Miami to Pittsburgh because they just blew things up there or whatever years ago you can get a Roquan Smith would be that kind of player for the Ravens the kind of player that they would have to go five and 12 to draft right so when those kind of players are available I don't know what's out there in that way or where you would want that kind of a player um you got a lot invested in safety. You got a lot invested in corner. You got a lot invested in D line. You got a lot invested in linebacker. To your point, you know you've spent money everywhere. Um, so I don't know what the trading deadline would hold for them, but I know the fans are going to hold on to say, "Well, they dealt for Roquan Smith. Can they get a game changing pass rusher?" Especially after watching Zadarius Smith play a little bit. Yeah, uh, I mean, I th- I think that's going to be the big question. I mean, look. Eric DaCosta's reputation. Now, last year, it was not a lack of effort. Obviously, they were in on Derrick Henry. We've talked about that. You've talked about that a lot. Uh, it didn't happen at that point in time. You know, and n- you, I, I wholeheartedly am fine with not being too hasty and, you know, giving up a first round pick for something that's not warranting a first round pick. And they're not going to do something like that. But you look at the history under Eric DaCosta and, and the league in general, I think we're seeing the trade deadline has become much more of a thing than it was even 10 years ago, where it was almost, uh, I mean, you think about the Ravens over their first 20 years of their history. I could think of one consequential trade at the deadline, Eugene Monroe, right. In 2013. So, but the, over the Eric DaCosta's tenure, you had Marcus Peters in 2019, you had Yannick Ngakwe, even though it didn't work out to a, the level that they hoped in 20. Roquan Smith in 22, right? So it's not as though they pull off a trade every year, but they're certainly in that market. And as I said in a previous segment, you know, kind of just joking around with, um, you know, my best friend who's a very knowledgeable, passionate Ravens fan. He's the one who said they could literally trade for any position on, on defense and probably justify it at this point. You know, could they, you know, defensive tackle, if everyone's healthy, if Marcus, if, if Michael Pierce isn't, you know, if, if this isn't a long-term injury, they're probably okay at defensive tackle. But edge, yeah. Out, you know, whether it's an outside linebacker or more of a, you know, just true uh, situational pass rusher, yeah. Inside linebacker, you know, I don't want to give up on Trenton Simpson, but if there would be some off-ball linebacker that you could rent that is really good in pass coverage that could ease some of the burden on Roquan Smith, it wouldn't be my top choice. It wouldn't be my top priority, but I'm not saying I'd necessarily even turn my nose up to that. Certainly you look at safety. I mean, safety's near the top of the list. And, and I would even say with safety, you could even think about it in terms of a rental, or is there someone that is signed beyond this year, knowing that Marcus Williams probably gone after this year, especially now. Uh, I mean, probably going to be a cap casualty in the off season. And Eddie Jackson isn't signed beyond this year anyway. So you could even say and go, go out and find, and and I don't know who it is off the top of my head. And, you know, having three wild cards is kind of like what we see in baseball. Now, who are the true buyers? Who are the true sellers? You know, it's a lit, the, the, the water's a little muddied, you know, I mean, unless you're talking about Carolina, for example. Uh, So is there a safety that shakes free that you might say, Hey, we like this guy right now. And we like this guy to be our starting safety for the next couple of years. He's under contract through next year. Well, hey, we'll dude, him- you mentioned Trenton Simpson. This is where you trade him to another team because they believe in him, right? I mean, there's also that part. I just want to wake that up from the trading standpoint to say, you know, this is where you trade John Simon or you trade some guy that is going to work out somewhere else that has 
has tread on the tire to get a rental, right? To get to yeah. get rid of a guy you're saying, eh, you know, maybe not, and he's a second round pick, third round pick. That happens too this week. Maybe not for the Ravens, but that happens. That's part of the trade deal too. It it can be. I'll, I'll give you a name. Not Trenton Simpson. Might David Ajabo be that guy? Uh, I mean, some other team that really loved him pre-draft and says, you know, we're we're going to lose this guy anyway, or we want to. We'd rather him have him than a fourth-round draft pick, right? I, I mean, maybe. And and again, and I'm not saying that that will definitely happen, but you know, you're thinking outside the box because. Yes, they can create cap room, but not unlimited cap room. Yes, they do have a nice set of draft picks projected for next year, but that doesn't mean you're going to go trade your first round pick. So sometimes you need to get creative and sometimes it's a pick swap. We've seen the Ravens do that kind of stuff as well. Well, I mean, if somebody thinks Ben Cleveland is their starting guard, right, for next year, like a bad team thinks that way, right? Like, hey, we 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 have to draft in that position anyway, and that guy's got two years of seasoning in the Ravens system and a couple years left on his contract. That's... That is the creativity that never existed 20 years ago in Billick's era, right? And really didn't exist much in Ozzy's era that has become much more of a modern thing with cap, money, years, manageability, and draft picks, and I need help right now. Yeah, I, and I think you know you may, you may mention of that. I mean, a lot of times we, we've thought about these deals in terms of picks for a player. If you look around, even some of the deals that have been made, you've actually seen. Now, there's usually a pick involved. But you're you're actually seeing some instances of player for player. So do I think that's the most likely thing they'll do? Probably not, because I, th- I think it would probably still come down to, you know, you trade a fourth round pick or, or whatever it is to to get player X at, at position Y. Um, but, you know, I, I think I think there are a lot of options on the table here because, again, pass rush and safety. I, I mean, that's a pretty wide net right there. And then again, I don't think it's their top priority because I do th- still think that they believe Trenton Simpson's going to be a good player. You know, I don't think he's been awful, but it's clear they they're having issues just in general at that position with pass coverage, including Roquan. So, you know, is, is there a guy that you could add to that mix in the way that maybe you have a little more of a rotation in the way that they kind of handled their, their inside linebackers when it was, you know, Patrick Queen, Josh Bynes, and LJ Fort, for example, you know, they kind of had three guys for two spots that they would kind of mix and match how they did it. I don't know. But when you have a defense that is in the state that this defense is in right now, you know, and, and even putting it, putting the injuries aside, I think there are a lot of options on the table right now. I, I think there, there, there's a lot, there are a lot of proverbial, you know, hoop, you know, balls in the air in terms of like trying to, say, okay, well, they could acquire a safety from this team, or that team might have an edge rusher that shakes free. I mean, you know, and again, will Cleveland trade Zedaria Smith to the Ravens specifically? You know, maybe not, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a comparable player that won't be available over the next week or so, but better hope they don't trade the Chiefs. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) That's very true, but if you're going to ask me to rank their top thing they need, I think I'd be inclined to say Go get another edge rusher. I think they can still try to figure out this safety thing. Maybe they can get Marcus Williams back on track. Maybe they, maybe Ardarius Washington gets more comfortable there. I don't know for sure. It's not, I'm not comfortable with that spot, but I, at, at edge rusher, I just see a group that needs more. They need another legitimate guy to add to that equation. Cause you know, they did the Ngakwe thing and that was fine, but I like him way more as a my number four or number five guy than my number three pass rusher in the rotation, which is what he is right now. And you know, I just don't think that's good enough, especially when you're trying to keep uh, you're trying to keep Kyle Van Noy as fresh as possible at 33 years old as you get into December and January. Two games in four days coming up, beginning on Sunday. Luke's out in Owings Mills all week long. We're monitoring the World Series. Also monitoring the American elections this week. We're going to be some election coverage around here as well. I am Nestor. He is Luke. We are WNST AM 1570. Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Baltimore, positive.